If you're confused about why we're not reading propers for number 26 of the lectionary here, it's because we're transferring the Feast of All Saints, which happens on Friday when not many of us are in church. Um, some time ago, the church, in its wisdom, realized people weren't coming to church in the middle of the week uh, for things like Ascension or Transfiguration or uh, All Saints. Yeah. And so we have permission to transfer uh, the feast day to the nearest Sunday. So in this case, the nearest Sunday is this Sunday. And then every year we read some variation of many of the scriptures that are appropriate at uh, a funeral. Which makes sense. Um, if any of you in your wisdom would like to share your understanding of the Feast of All Saints and why we even have it, what its importance is in the church calendar, and why it would matter. You know, any of you remember your... I thought we were celebrating all the, the saints, and there were a lot of saints that came from this world. You may remember all those who have gone before us, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And have, uh, probably since the 4th century, I think it got located in this place around the 8th, 9th, or 10th century, and mostly because many other cultures, as you know, celebrate a fall festival of some kind, a changing of the seasons, a recognition of things that are going away, and an anticipation of going into, right, a season where, where it's darker, where things are not growing, right? And so the church, in her wisdom, which is true of many of our celebrations, right, uh, adopted or adapted um, uh, local customs around this celebration of ancestors. So we remember on this day those who God calls saints, who in the church calls saints of God. And we know that the day before that is All Hallows' Eve, right. which is Halloween. And for us Lutherans, it's also Reformation Day. So we did Reformation Sunday last Sunday, but I was at Good Shepherd. But I made sure to watch my church service first because I had to hear A Mighty Fortress. I just yeah, we have to do that on Reformation Day. That's right. <laughs> I love that. Wear red. That's a good. Or did you wear red? I don't know. Did you asking. wear red? Well, I didn't because I was going to Good Shepherd. But when I'm uh, at my home church, yes, we wear red on Reformation Day and Pentecost Sunday. And I yeah. have my seasonal reds to wear. But no, I just like fall for uh, Good Shepherd. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, uh, we so three, three different days which are, are tied together in... Uh, all Saint, all how, uh, all Hallows Eve, All Saints Day, and All Souls Day, and yeah. the, those three are known as the Hallow Tide. Yeah. And I think I think that's where the Alabama football fans uh, got their cheer. <laughs> Indubitably, <laughs> Hello, Tide. Uh, no. Oh, hollow tide. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah, so it's a it's a time of year, um, I guess, again, celebrated by many cultures that we've uh, kind of placed in this time in our calendar. And our parish celebrates not only All Saints Day, but then the commemoration of the faithfully departed, which we will celebrate a week from tomorrow, mm -hmm. where we remember all who have died in our lives. Uh, and while oftentimes, you know, death is a loss, obviously, every time, it is that chance for us to renew, once again, our faith in the resurrection, right? It's a chance to explore what we believe about what happens after we leave this plane of existence um, and what is God's plan for us forever and ever and ever. Amen. So, um, oh, you know, that we get to revisit all that. Uh, again. So here's Allison. the 
Allison, I'd, I'd like to call upon my brother Rich, who's kind of asleep at the wheel, so that Rich can tell us what the true meaning of a New Orleanian about All Saints Day is. Huh. <coughs> it's the birthday of what? Oh, the Saints. New Orleans Saints. Saints. Right, I, I forgot about that. <coughs> what was that, 69, 1969, thereabouts? It was the day that the uh, NFL uh, granted, if you will, the the right to the New Orleans uh, NFL team. It was, if you will, the birthday of the Saints. Now, the way they've been playing, is, I think it's no wonder that All Souls Day follows All Saints Day. <laughs> they certainly have looked like after winning two, they've, they've gone into their state of demise. <laughs> oh well it's sometimes good to remember a birth then <laughs> <laughs> the expectation of what might be um, well I didn't know that and I'll, I'll try to hold on to that for future reference for sure thank you both for that can we pray yes. almighty God you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your son Christ our Lord Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those ineffable joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. 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 Okay, any comments on the on the topic before we good morning Alma before good we morning. move uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Isaiah. I, I'm the preacher, so I chose the Isaiah reading because it's what, one such, one question on the college. Yeah. When we say the elect, are they self-elected? Are they chosen by God, by Jesus, by the Trinity? Is it happening in the past, the present, or the future? Or are we just chalk it up to mystical, we don't know? Well, and actually, we do know a little bit. Because as Episcopalians, we would say that the, the knitting together of the elect is not our doing at all. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the elect of God. And uh, we believe that all are created in the image and likeness of God. And so, I think it follows, I could be interpreting something here, but I think it follows that all are the elect of God. Uh, unless you opt out, which, you know, people do opt out. Uh, that's what we call free will. So, I think that's, uh, God's elect would be all of God's people. Okay. It's interesting to use the word elect, uh, that, uh, you know, November 5th is election day. <laughs> it's hard to hear the word elect without uh, maybe having a bit of panic in your voice. But um, different kind of election, or, or maybe the best example of a different kind of election, right? uh, based on God's uh, love and affection and desire uh, on, his, on God's part for his people. But certainly, Martin, one could have that read other ways depending on how one group or another wanted to use it. Yeah. I, over, over the centuries, uh, certainly people have thought they were the elect of God. I'm sure you've experienced that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right, uh, let's see. Collins, would you read from the book of Isaiah? You muted, Collins. You might also be frozen. <laughs> he looks frozen. <laughs> now he doesn't. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, Laura, maybe Collins will, will hold on to you for a different reading, one 
when technology catches up with your desire. Uh, Laura, okay. thank you. A reading from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. Wow. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thank Thank you, God. God. Well, what say you all? <laughs> what mountain? What mountain? What mountain, what mountain that be? Or is it? Is it poetic? Is it the mountain of life? The mountain of I mean, what mountain? Are we so, about? so much of Israel's life was centered around one of two mountains, right? <laughs> Sinai was one. Now I said that, and I'm going to um, just completely blanking. Whatever that mountain is that's... Uh, or Hebron. Or up, um, could be the mount. Hebron. It could, it could be the mount that's, um, that was the center of uh, life in, in Judah, right? Israel had one mountain, Sinai, and uh, Judah had a different mountain. Oh, my God. Outside Seshem. So I mean, there are there were mount, mountains are important in almost every tradition, right? Because why? Well, where does God reside? I mean, I, I'm speaking metaphorically. God resides in the heavens. What's closer to the heavens? The mountain. The mountains, right? So um, <clears throat> it means someplace close to where God resides, or someplace God actually resides. I mean, even in Greek tradition, right? Where did Zeus reside? We remember that. We'll have a rich feast. This is the month of Thanksgiving. We'll have a rich feast. Well, it's uh, it, it, it's someplace where I want to go. It doesn't say you will enter the desolation, you know, the, the whatever, the desolating sacrilege. That's, uh, that's from Matthew and Mark. But, you know, it says something beautiful. It, it describes and explains uh, something beautiful. Something beautiful. And what do we enjoy? We, when we get together, we enjoy sharing what we have with others. We enjoy a feast. We uh -huh. enjoy what would be better than a well-aged wine strained twice. I mean, there's a lot of care taken there, isn't there? Yeah. Don't you hear the care taken in the in the preparation of this feast? And it's available to who? Everyone. Yeah, it says all people. All people. Doesn't say some people, doesn't say people who look like me or dress like me or went to school where I went to school. It's all people. Alice, to me. Yes, Collins. I, I think I did get uh, connected back again. Um, yes. People okay. is, people normally is, uh, connotes plural, but this particular says people. Oops. It's the great variety of peoples. <laughs> yeah, it says it not once, but twice, in fact. In the first line, make for all peoples a rich food, and then later, in the second sentence, it destroys the shroud that is cast for all peoples. So all peoples. And then what is this shroud? How do you hear that shroud? Mm 
It's rather death. Um, I think it, that's what's implied for sure. Because in, in much of uh, at the t Israel uh, cosmology, right, there was the pit. <laughs> there was the way of understanding Sheol, right? This thing that goes over the earth, and then there's the pit where all the terrible things happen in the world and where you go. And um, oh. it describes something a little bit different here that this shroud would be destroyed. Collins, are you able to speak to us? We have you on twice. Huh? I don't know. I'm trying to get rid of one. one. <laughs> there I go. I, think, right. um, I disconnected to one so that I could speak clearly on the other one. So I believe okay. I can speak to you now. Good. Thank you. All right. Uh, anyone else want to say anything about this passage from Isaiah? This is still first Isaiah, basically. I mean, it's a hopeful passage. I think we can say that. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to pipe in with our Lord of Hosts is how it's uh, written here. Lord mm -hmm. of Hosts sometimes is described uh, as Lord Almighty. And while hosts are considered to be the armies, the uh, Martin, the armies might not just be of men. They may be sometimes of locusts or other uh, uh, other things other than uh, people or angels. Uh, so the Lord of Hosts sometimes will cover insects and sometimes it will just refer to the lord almighty or the host of angels right yeah you hear well, that well well it can be of angels but sometimes it goes to def uh, identify other host besides just angels and to some extent the lord uses you allison and laura and alma and Bill and Rich, Martin, and me as God's host to carry forward God's will to uh, for us to go forward as as together uh, part of God's host, uh, and it's important for us not to separate ourselves from one another in the sense of God's will for us. There's a messianic overlay, it seems like, where you could read that into it, certainly. How do you see that, Martin? Well, the overcoming of death, um, that, that perhaps in Judaism this is sufficient, and for Christians, another overlay is more sufficient to obtain salvation. Yeah. It's the promise of something, for sure. Yeah. Um, with, a, with a group of people, spoken to a group of people for whom maybe there was not enough to eat, right? Right? You can see that that promise of what a reward would look, a reward, I don't know that that's the intention of Isaiah. I'm using the word, which overlays its own sort of <clears throat> theology, doesn't it? If I say it's a reward, there's a sense that you had to earn it, right? There's a sense that it comes at the end of some sort of struggle. I, 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 don't, think, I don't think that's how we read it looking back. Right, we, we hopefully have developed more of a gift theology of what God gives us, uh, not something that we earn. We all know that there is nothing, I hope we know, right, that there is nothing we do or don't do that earns us a place at this table. This is a place that's guaranteed to us, not by what we do, but what by what God does. does. Yeah, but so... The temporal element is interesting. It's will happen. Yeah. 
Um, whether no, because it's, it's, it's not currently happening in Isaiah's time, is it? That was yeah. not, if you know a little bit of history, you know, that's not what was happening, generally speaking. Isaiah was speaking into how whoever Isaiah was and for the number of people that were Isaiah writing were not living at a time where people, this would have to be something in the future. Because the present moment was was being occupied by um, foreign entities, people either being uh, subsumed by another culture or sent away or under some sort of distress. Their kingdom, as they knew it, had been or was in the process of being destroyed. So uh, this is a promise that says, hey, uh, to me, says, hey, y'all who are listening, I've been in conversation with God, which is what a prophet was supposed to be saying, and here's what the promise is. We have to hold tough. Maybe it's the best halftime um, uh, pep talk. I don't know. It's like a pep talk, right? Hold, hold tight. Hold tight to what we have made covenants about. Hold tight to what we believe. Hold tight. There, this is what God's intention is for us. Not, not what you're seeing. Not what you're experiencing at the present moment, but something better. This is why it's read at funerals, right? In the midst of, of sadness and loss and grief, we have this promise. There's something, there's something very... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Martin and Laura. No head, Martin. There's something, there's something very comforting about saying it's God's job. It's not ours. Mm -hmm. That's a great reminder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even if we don't like the what we're experiencing at the present moment. Laura? Uh, going back to the collect, when uh, it speaks of those ineffable joys that you have prepared, you know, and you can't even describe them. They're going to be so wonderful. And we're looking at the reading from Isaiah where we, where we say, wipe away the tears. We see yeah. the joy in Psalm 24. We've, Revelation has wipe away tears. And of course, with yeah. uh, Lazarus, yeah, those, those tears that were shed for him were wiped away. So uh, this, I think, all ties in with the ineffable joys that we're going to experience because God loves us so much. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. It's not a denial of anything either, right? I think there's that, you know, we, it's, it's a, there's not a denial of the tears, right? It's not just saying, oh, well, I'm not going to think about the tears, or we don't have any tears, or with God, there are no tears. No, that's not true. There are tears. And so but there, there certainly is something greater than tears. Good morning, Mary. Glad to see you, Mary. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, anything else on Isaiah? And thank you, Laura, for connecting the readings for us as we go, too, because... Oh, you know, I, I think the Collars and Scholars <laughs> did that for us. Yeah. <laughs> well, as we discuss them today, for sure. Allison? Yes? Uh, I'd like to note that you're tying in on that reading with the gospel reading, um, which includes one of the shortest verses about Jesus in the Bible. Jesus. Laura, what is it? Jesus wept. Yes. So that is a, another uh, tie-in uh, with Isaiah. It sure is. Well, Mary, since you've entered the room, I would love if you and Rich would read the psalm, Psalm 24. Thank you. you. Start? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all who dwell therein. For it is he who founded it upon the seas and made it firm upon the rivers of the deep. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord and who can stand in his holy place? Those who, have, those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not pledged themselves to falsehood, nor sworn by what is fraud. They shall receive a blessing from the Lord, 
and a just reward from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift your, up your heads, O gates, lift them high, O everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle? Lift up your heads, O gates, lift them high, O everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. That's a beautiful song. Yeah. Yeah, often the um, doorbell, is that you? Good morning. Yes. Often those verses 7 and 9, I always think of as announcing Advent, right? You know, open the doors. I think of it like an Advent calendar itself. Open the doors and who, who's coming? Um, so that's what I always think of in Psalm 34, uh, Psalm 24, in verse 7 and 9. Mm -hmm. And how often have we asked that question ourselves? Who is this King of glory? Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. There we go. We get our answer. I like it when I can ask a question and get an answer in the same scripture. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often for me, that's for sure. What else? What strikes you this morning? What or perplexes you or encourages you? What what's going on in this song? In your hearts. Glory. Yeah. It's a word that has a whole set of uh, images, isn't it, Collins? Just, just the, the word itself kind of brings forth to me a whole set of images. And in this psalm, the glory is tied to the king. And the king is identified as the, uh, the Lord of hosts, but also the king of glory. And we might consider for a moment what does that actually mean that God is identified as the king of glory mm -hmm. it tells us there. I don't yeah. see the answer I don't see, Allison I don't see the answer to that question in this particular song. that one did not get answered however it could be that the king of glory is not the king of Babylon the king of glory is not the king of Persia. The king of glory is not the king of Assyria or Egypt. Uh, right? This, that, that there, I and mean, then this may have been written long before that, right? This may have actually be this is actually a very old psalm. But <clears throat> I mean, I, I guess you could say think of it that way. It's in the absence of what it is not. Um, so, so we all, and we know that throughout the Old Testament, uh, prophets uh, have gone to great lengths to try to tell people uh, that God is not like the other kings. And even to the people of Israel, right, in the, in the books of, oh, I don't know, judges and uh, kings, that even those who thought they needed a king, remember all those interchanges, where the people went to God saying, we need a king. <laughs> we can't do this ourselves. We need a king. And they and God said, you don't need a king. I'm the king. <laughs> <laughs> Kings like people are, are going to be inadequate. Doesn't mean they won't be good people often, or they might not have good ideas, but they're going to be inadequate to serve the kingdom, the, the kingdom of God. They're, they're just not, they're just not suited. They, they just can't. And so, because, why? Because uh, they have interests of their own. They, they have, you know, biases and blinders and whatever it is that we, <clears throat> that we know that we possess, right? Yeah. And many of us have been in leadership positions where, One more right? Time. Uh, you've been the senior ward. That's right. Did you make any mistakes? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, so <laughs> <in Taiwan. laughs> 
Now I can't. <laughs> okay, Martin. Uh, anthropomorphize this a little bit. Uh -huh. Lift up your foot. Oh, Gates, lift them high. Oh, I mean, almost like he's encouraging us to, or the, the writer is to open your eyes. Be over half hour or before 10. Well, I'll turn off your speaker, please. Um, <laughs> lift up your eyes, lift up your heads, lift up your, open your hearts. Uh, that it's not a, uh, that the doors are not, they're, they're poetic, right? They're, they're, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Although, do not. Corbo, you have to mute yourself. Come out of the conversation. Okay, so the, the gates of Jerusalem. Ooh, maybe it won't be crap, but I could see how that would actually be quite nice. Martin, do you have some impact here? Corbo, turn off your speaker. <laughs> how do I do that? <laughs> I thought I was muted. I Alex told me I was muted. Hi, Hi everybody. Well. Trust me, you're not. Hi, Corbell. <laughs> oh, did I lose you? Now you're first. <laughs> 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 oh, <I'm over. laughs> All right, well, let me, let's see. Oh. Okay. We have 25 minutes remaining. I'll try to hold it together for you all. So this idea of the fortress of Jerusalem, right, that, that's used in many places. That which protects God's people it could be that which God lets in. Let, you know, what, are, what is the... We're, we're, there's not a sense of closure here or that the gates would be something that kept people out, but that maybe provided protection or inclusion. So thank you for that. I think there is a great deal of that found in there, um, that kind of language. Yes, yeah, so the the gates representing the kingdom, for sure. And we have to be encouraging in order to allow what? God to come in. Right? This closed sense would not be something that would give God access. If you even thought for a moment about a heart, your own heart, what would you be, you know, you could take those those couple of verses to talk about your own interior walls mm -hmm. that sometimes keep things out, allow things in. Yeah. Anything else on the song? <clears throat> Any other favorite verses? Things that jump out? Okay. Bill, could you read the revelation to John for us? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
So those themes that Laura highlighted, here they are. All people, um, not quite that same way, but will be his peoples. Wipe away every tear. Death will be no more. Pain will be no more. These things have passed away. And we know it says the Alpha and the Omega. The first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So all things, just like when we say A to Z or A to Z, wherever we were raised. So, you know, it has that, that breath. There is nothing outside of this. Well, it's truly, there must be something outside of it. I mean, um, but there's not, but not according to this revelation that John had, which may have been a hunger-induced uh, vision. And yet, what a great echo. It's not inconsistent, is it? It's not like, it's not like John just, this is something John had never, that had never been explored in uh, religious thought. Right? It, he's echoing that those words of Isaiah, that those words of Psalm 24, he's, you know, he's restating that. He's agreeing, if you will, with that. Right? Sometimes revelation to, to St. John is hard for us to read. It gets reinterpreted in many ways. People have written tons of books on it, for sure. Uh, has influenced a ton of thinking about uh, when the world will end or when Jesus will return or etc. Um, because it's so rich with metaphor. And so you know it has to contain a lot because so much has been said about it. Uh, so it's, it's a lot's to be reinterpreted, for sure. I'm sorry, Anna. It's <laughs> a different wavelength here. <laughs> so, You're on so a different here's... wavelength. Okay, now, talk to me about the revelation to John and its importance on this All Saints. This feast of All Saints. Martin? So who is on the throne? The Lord God Almighty. And is it God or is it Jesus? Is it the Trinity? God. Um, because see the home of God is among mortals. And then from the throne it says write this for those words are untrustworthy and true. Then he said to me it is done. I, I am the Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end. Is that God saying that? Is that Jesus saying that or Trinity saying that? Is it possible that it's all of that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that yeah, is I the, mean, creator, the creator that holds all things. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I, I, I don't know. That there's, to me, there's no differentiation in that, you know, because I, I, I think of those three ways of, that we see and understand how God is in this world with us. Then, then you know... Um, it sounds to me like that's the God of uh, everlasting. If, if that's the only thing I could use to describe it, the God that was before and during and after, right? Like how, however we manifest that. And, and the, it's the temporal nature. Is this talking about something in the future? Is it talking about a conversion of somebody now or a saint in the past? I don't know. He's describing a vision that he had. So I don't, it's it's hard to know that. When, the new when you have a vision, heaven, it's going to be coming to you. When the new Jerusalem comes, is the only, right, Ginger, that's the only kind of qualifier that we have. And what is the new Jerusalem? Oh, well, I know this. It's not the old Jerusalem. That's a start, but other than that, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's I'll not, think. there's not a sense of finish. Yes, Collins. After you finish, I'll, I'll make my comment. Yeah, go ahead. I wasn't going to say anything. All right. Um, I'd, I'd like to point out one important word in this uh, revelation. And it's down. 
D-O-W-N. Most of us think of us going up to heaven. And most of us want to get on the train that's going up to heaven. John's talking about a vision of the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God mm. and that God's going to dwell with them. I, I don't know who it was that talked to me about this or had preached or written or, or questioned, but this is one of the mysteries in which in the future or the end time or there will be a time when out of heaven comes down God to be with mortals uh, and not just in the quote uh, reincarnation if you will of Jesus but I believe that it's you know the, if you will, Martin, the triune God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, that are manifested, no pun intended, <laughs> in the visible human man that we recognize as Jesus, the incarnate word. So I think this is a wonderful uh, scripture for us to if you will meditate on what does it really mean that uh, the home of God is among mortals uh, it, it's a little different from the spin of in uh, in heaven there are many homes you know and it's just another if you will opening up of the mystery of what will occur in the future yeah. Thank you. I, I was thinking of when Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is neither low here or low there, right? The kingdom is among us. Uh, so it, it's in that same sense. Um, I, I, well, certainly a different kind of theology of, well, you know, when I die, um, I will be ushered in into this new Jerusalem. That's, there's, a, there's a way of certainly that people have thought about things for years. Then there's also the idea that our job, if you will, or our creation has been to help usher in the kingdom of heaven in this time and place, right? So, so those are different ways of understanding how God operates in this world, what God's intention is for God's people. I, you know, um, and, and then do I, do I pull occasionally from both of those pots of theology? I absolutely do. I absolutely hope that, you know, in, in the end, when I die, that uh, I am surrounded by those that have gone before me and that my life is somehow easier, uh, less trouble, perhaps. And I also am, am fully encamped in the idea that God has empowered each of us, given us gifts to go forth and realize the kingdom of heaven among us. Right. So I, I kind of dwell with one foot in each of those. <laughs> and on what they talk to me. All right, Martin, one more thing, and then we're going to move on to the gospel. The what's the difference between the first heaven and the new heaven? What does that mean to you? <laughs> I mean, I right answer. Sure. Answer with a question. <laughs> 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 there must be something that differentiates that, right? For John on this vision, what is the way of the world? If John is writing at a time when he's hiding in a cave because he's been uh, he's been fleeing from persecution of some kind, he's witnessed the fall of Jerusalem, right? If you put it in the context of what was happening in the world around him. Rome was exercising all the power Rome had to be Rome and to be not what was in Palestine before. So that being said, 
what would a new what would it look like the difference between how we've treated each other you know how, how we've been how life has been and something different the promise of something different again echoing back to Isaiah so that's the best I can do when I when I think about what would he be referring to I have to think about what is his context and then also, you know, it's important for us, the reason scripture has survived all these years is because we've been able to reimagine and, and re-visualize what is our old and what is our new. But, you know, but we, we have to be able to put it into our own context. Otherwise, it's just a history book, which is fine. Yet, does it have promise for us, you know, something else? Thank you. Sure. All right, I'm going to read this gospel, um, okay, which is going to be so familiar to many of you. It's often read on Good Friday. It's often read on the week before uh, the Passion. It's you know, so it's it's a familiar text for sure. Mm. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, "Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died." When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came into came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. <clears throat> Something different that you've heard this time in this kind of familiar reading? Something comforting? Something challenging? Well, this was the ultimate miracle. Uh, yeah. We're uh, bringing someone back from the dead. It's obviously the ultimate miracle. Absolutely. And a little bit of foreshadowing, correct? You're a good literary person. This is a lot of foreshadowing, isn't it? About what God's uh, abilities are when it comes to raising people from the dead. Laura. Um, I may have a lawnmower going out by the window, but what stood out to me that I hadn't really noticed before was the fact that Jesus said this out loud so that the crowd would hear what he was saying and, and believe that he had been sent by God. Oh. Yeah. Uh, that, that just struck me this time. And it, it, you know, it, it was the, you know, Lazarus coming out from the tomb that had always gotten me before, but this one really, jumped out at me yeah mute. Thank you. yes thank you I, I think 
Um, I would be interested to know why you think that stood out to you. I mean, you may not know that in this moment, right? Uh, you may not know what's happening there uh, with the Holy Spirit, but there there might be something happening there about why that would stand out to you today. I, I keep having to mute because the lawnmower goes by my window. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't sound like a lawnmower myself, but yeah. it's just important that he's you know, trying to educate the crowd that, you know, perhaps there are a lot of unbelievers there, that he's the son of God, the Messiah. And so he's providing evidence. Uh, Collins, they do that in a court of law, don't they? Yeah, they do. Is it possible that Jesus still speaks to us, right? Like this idea <clears throat> that we too might have something to learn in this. I, I think, um, or that there, you know, that it was, it seems cruel almost because I, you have the sister saying, if you would have been here, he would not have died. You have people crying. You have Jesus's own sense of loss at this friend of his, right? Who has been probably, they have been companions of his for a while, right? So you have that. And then uh, he's using it as a teaching moment, right? Well, you yeah, kind of showed up earlier and taught us the same thing. Um, awesome. Right. Interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a little reversal for him. Okay, Collins and then Martin. I think it's very important that we understand that Jesus delayed his arrival yeah. and there was a purpose for his delay, delaying uh, coming uh Jesus, uh, this isn't the first raising from the dead uh, that Jesus uh, performed the miracle of, but this is the only, quote, resurrection from, the, a, from a grave. And uh, like Laura, I have the, uh, the gardeners outside, but this, they're blowing, so I'm going to go on mute now. <laughs> That's right. You think about uh, Jairus' daughter. I think of that. The two of yeah. <laughs> Martin. The thing that really jumps out at me this morning is unbind him. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what we all want? Is to be unbound and safe? Yeah. Aren't yeah. we all bound in some way or another? Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that, you know, for us, as we consider what is what are those things uh, that bind us and that Jesus is still calling us out of those places, those dark places, those looks like, you know, I'm thinking of Monty Python, not dead yet. Uh, <laughs> you know, so the things, the places where we're not quite dead yet, but we are close. Uh, and and uh, so, um, yeah, thank you. few more minutes, Laura. Um, one of the sources that I read said that back then the Jews thought that the soul did not leave the body until after three days, and that may be why Jesus waited for this fourth day. Um, uh -huh. you know, I did more research, and I, my current source on Judaism says they believe the soul leaves the body upon death. But, uh -huh. um, so... Anyway, I've got a you know, one how it's tied yeah, because in most, yeah, in most most uh, Jewish traditions, the burial of the body happens within three days, right? That they're, they're it's not like you know they don't wait. So there must be something in there, Laura, that sort of was either, if not prescribed by Torah, <clears throat> by practice, right? Um, that uh, that people um, followed because I do think that. That, that still the practice in Judaism is to bury uh, someone who has died within three days. So, ah, uh, yeah. Okay, Collins. Uh, the Rolling Stones, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> we're not just talking about a band. We're talking about two stones that were <laughs> rolled away from the tombs, the tomb of of Lazarus and the tomb of Jesus. Now, it's important to note 
the purpose of the rolling stones are definitely different. In Lazarus' case, the stone had to be rolled away for Lazarus to get out. But in Jesus' case, the rolling of the stone, the purpose of that was not so that Jesus could get out, no, so that we could see in. Mm. And it's important, it's important for us to not just look at a resurrected Lazarus, but for us to look in to the tomb of Jesus and what it meant and to appreciate how important the resurrection is to our faith. Absolutely. Can you imagine us gathering together yeah. as just uh, historians that said, yeah, Jesus, he got crucified, end of story. I mean, would we even bother? I, there would be no history of Jesus if he had just died on the cross. There were lots of people that were crucified. But it is the miracle of the resurrection that right. really brings us to this point in our spiritual lives and hopefully inspires us to have a deeper understanding of what it meant for Jesus to be resurrected. Thank you. Well, yeah. I can't think of a better note on which to end. Um, thank you, Collins. And uh, may uh, uh, all your journeys of inward looking today and this week remind you of those who have uh, surrounded you throughout your life and who will continue to surround you even into your death. Those who have brought this message to you and who continue to and to know that each of you are that to someone else. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I will 